As you can see, the kids are going to be in the service with us today, which I'm very excited about. Um, because you know what, I was thinking this morning, just to, just a little bit of family housekeeping. You know, when I was praying about the service and stuff like that, I was thinking, you know, Lord, what do we do with the kids today? Do we have them, you know, dancing and singing up the back? Or do we just leave them sit with their parents? You know, how do we involve the kids in our praise and worship and in our service in a way that's uplifting for everyone. And, you know, as I was thinking about, you know, do we put them up the back, you know, because we can't, we don't want them running around too rowdy. And the Lord just reminded me, you know what, we'd much rather have the kids running around just joyful and celebrating as we praise and worship the Lord than us dying on the inside because we're trying to restrict and limit and be so proper. So let's embrace the kids this morning. Yes, we don't want them hanging from the rafters, so to speak, but let's, um, let's all be excited about worshiping the Lord today. So kids or adults as well, you are welcome. Uh, Abishel will tell you more about that. But let's stand and get ready for the service today. I'm going to pray just as we start to begin and bring our hearts, our thoughts before the Lord this morning. Oh, Lord, just as I welcome everybody else here, whether they're in the room online, we above all welcome you, Lord. We welcome your Holy Spirit. We thank you that you dwell in us and that you help us. I ask, like it says in your word, that you will help us to worship in spirit and in truth, that we will come in one accord this morning as we celebrate you, as we worship you, the one true God, the one who paid the wages of our sin, the price for our penalty. It should have been us dying, but you died on our behalf, and we're so grateful. And as we remember you today, this Palm Sunday, we want to celebrate you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. So yeah, as what Cindy have said, kids, you're free to come in front, and as we sing the song, you can jump around, you can, um, yeah, dance around and do what you want in here, and just, yeah, worship the Lord and have fun, because uh, the Lord loves you guys, and the Lord wants you guys to have fun in His presence. So yeah, and feel free if the parents want to come in front to dance with them or anything like that. Just feel free to be, to do that because yeah, the Lord is here, and the Lord loves families because He created us in families. So yeah, just be free. Sing wandering into the night. Wandering into the night. Wanting a place to hide this weary soul is by the bones. And I try with all my mind, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a vagabond. Just when I, and just when I.
Jesus. 
Let us rest in green meadows. You lead us beside peaceful streams. You renew our strength. You guide us along bright paths, bringing honour to your name, holy God. Bringing honour to your name, holy God. We want to honour you in this place today. We want to honour you in our lives, Lord doesn't matter whether we're young or old. We just want to honour you today, Holy God, because you are the only one who deserves the praise and the glory. Bless your name, Lord. Have your way here, Holy Spirit. Have your way here, Holy Spirit. Have your way here, Holy Spirit. today, Lord. Have your way. I'm just going to invite Lachlan to lead us in remembering Jesus as we share communion together today. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I just, yeah, just was just thinking about what communion is, and it's actually just focusing on Jesus' death and just seeing the victory that he had and seeing who he has as King and as Lord. And, and as Christians, we actually believe that he died and he rose again and that he is powerful and almighty. And, and as we look at communion in the Bible uh, and we look at or at the Passover as Jesus breaks the bread and says, this is my body and then hands it out to all of them. And it also says that, you know, this is my blood and, and it hands out the wine to them. And, and he says to do this all in remembrance of him. I just want us to actually just focus on Isaiah 53, 5 to 12 today. I'm just going to read through um, and then I'll just kind of yeah, explain uh, what we'll kind of do from there. But yeah, Isaiah 53, 5 to 12 says, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and we have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb this that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land and of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He was put to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. He is the knowledge and shall be, by his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he was poured out, poured out his soul to death, and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many, and makes intercession for the transgressors. Yeah, what a privilege we have to actually partake in his death, that actually we have victory, not because, because of who we are, but because of who he is. He actually paid the price for our sin. And, and this is actually a time where we actually be so grateful and say, 
yes, we, we admit that we're sinners and we're humble in it and we understand that, but we're also so grateful, so um, just, yeah, happy because of what he's done for us and we actually get to give him glory and honor for what he's done. And so the way that I would actually like to do communion today is actually just with the people around you, just sharing what God has given you victory in over your life. What has Jesus' blood actually meant to you? Just take a moment just to just to speak to the people next to you and, and just share. It doesn't have to be something huge, but let's give God glory. Let's honor God by sharing as a community, as coming together as believers and actually, yeah, giving God glory. So if you just want to go to the person next to you, whoever you're comfortable with, but let's actually give God some glory this morning by just sharing what He's done in our lives, whether that be He's given breakthrough in your life financially, whether He's broken things off in your life, whether you've seen healing in your life. There's, there's so much to be grateful for. So I just, yeah, want to give you a moment just to uh, just, just be grateful and then I'll kind of come back and we'll pray and then take the emblems. So you can get up or you can stay where you are. Just, yeah, feel free to just share what God's doing in your life. Yeah, I just I encourage you to keep doing this actually as you go throughout the week and even after the service. If if God's brought victory or breakthrough in something in your life, I just encourage you to share and to yeah, just share the testimony of what God's done. Uh, I'm just gonna pray um, and then feel free to take the emblems at your own time and and just reflect on on the the things that Jesus's blood has paid for and and just give Him glory for that. But yeah, I'm just gonna just pray. Lord, I just want to say thank you so so much for who you are. Lord, I thank you that you're perfect, that you are the way, the truth, and the life. I thank you that you're the creator. God, I thank you for your perfect love, and I thank you, Jesus, for, for dying on the cross for us, for paying for the price for our sins, and, and for healing us, God. And I thank you for, for what you've done, Lord. I'm, I'm sorry, Father, for, the, for my sins, God, that put you upon that cross. But, God, I just want to give you all glory and all honor for, for who you are. God, I thank you for your mercy and your grace upon all of our lives, Lord. And yeah, I just thank you, Jesus, for your blood washing us clean and making us whole. Yeah, I thank you so much for, Jesus, what you're doing in our lives right now, that you're alive and that you're active and that you're still moving, God. I thank you for who you are, and I just give you all glory and all honor. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.
this morning. I want to welcome those that are online this morning. So uh, let's get around. Let's let's gather and say hello and yeah and catch up. That'd be great. Fantastic. Great to have you all here today. Why don't you uh, grab your Bibles? If you, if you don't have your Bible on you, there is one at the end of the aisle if you need. Um, or you can actually go on your Moses devices, go on your tablets, which would be great. So we're journeying through our Go series. Uh, talking about what does it mean as a body of people or a person that reaches out with the gospel of Jesus Christ? What does that look like when we're sharing the gospel with people and talking to people about that? Just a few truths um, before we start off today. Thank you, Sharon. The next slide. We serve a missionary God. The Father sent the Son. The Son sent the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit sends us. Isn't that good? Isn't that good to know that? That our God is a missionary God, you know? He sent His Son, the Son sent the Holy Spirit, and then the Holy Spirit sends us out on that same mission, is to reconcile and to bring people through to Christ. 
Regardless of what we do as a job, our real vocation is sharing the gospel. I'm just going to let that one sink in for just a little bit. What does that mean to you, you know? Regardless of what we do as a job or an occupation, what we do as a trade, what we do to bring income in, regardless of all of those things, which are important, our real vocation is sharing the gospel with people. Our carpentry skills, our managerial skills, they're all good. Our leadership skills are all great and we learn those things. But the one thing that gets rejoiced in heaven is when souls come to the kingdom. Souls come in. And if we happen to be there and the Lord wants us to use that to share the gospel, what a wonderful occupation. Again, we talked about along the first week that we are all missionaries because God has sent us forth. So welcome missionary people this morning in the house, you know. <laughs> Give someone a high five beside you say, you look good as a missionary this morning. Yeah, you do good. You look good. <laughs> Fantastic. Let's open up our Bibles to the book of John. Thank you, Sharon. The book of John. Book of John chapter 1. And let's have a look at this. Book of John chapter 1. Verses 30, 35 to... 49. Story of Jesus calling his first disciples. So we'll have a look at this once you're there. And let's see this. Here we go. Verse 35. The next day, John was there again. That's John the Baptist talking of there. So John the Baptist, he was the prelude to Jesus. John was there again with two of his disciples. So John had two of his disciples. And when he saw Jesus passing by, John said this, Look, the Lamb of God. And when the two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Poor John, hey? He just lost two of his disciples. <laughs> Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said, come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he, staying, where he was staying, sorry, and they spent the day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Now, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. And the first thing that Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You would be called Cyphus or Cephas, which is translated as Peter. So there is Peter. And the next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee, finding Philip. And he said to him, Follow me. And Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the, was from the town of Bethsaida. And Philip found Nathanael. How cool is this? And told him, Hey, we found one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come out of there? Nathaniel said, come and see, Philip said. Remember we talked about last week, come and see, come. Come and see, said Philip. And when Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said to him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there was no deceit. How do you know me? Nathaniel asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. What a cool portion of scripture when you, when you really see the dynamics of that, how wonderful that is. Today, I want to talk about this. I want to talk about barbecuing them to Jesus. <laughs> I want to talk about relational circle, your relational circuit, a circle that you have. You don't want to put them on the barbecue, all right, just, I want to talk about barbecuing them to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, as we just dive into your word today, that you open a heart and give us revelation, Lord God, of what is already around us in our life, 
that circle of relationships that we have, Father God, and how you are always working in that. And I thank you, Father God, that we will receive that today in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. You know, I was 26 years of age, so it was October the 26th, 1996, when a friend of mine brought me to church. Yeah, that means I'm getting older, Michael. <laughs> I saw your look on your face. I saw you said, man, I know, I'm getting older, buddy. I'm getting older, not old, okay? Um, but I was 26 years of age when I got saved, and a friend brought me to church. I'd been brought up as a, a Catholic in the Catholic church. I had a sort of an understanding of who Jesus was, but I hadn't had an encounter with him yet. It wasn't really real to me. But on that day when the friend brought me to church, it just happened to be the day that I got saved. Sharon, next slide. Do you know that 95% of people come to Christ through relationship? Now, that's a statistic. So today, I'm really hoping when we do this, we're going to prove the stats correct. Okay, okay. I want you to put up your hand this morning. If you came to Christ, either number one, through a friend or a colleague, through somebody you knew, maybe a neighbour, maybe a, a cousin, an uncle, an auntie, or maybe you were brought up already in a Christian household, put up your hand if that was you today. Now look around the room. Look, I think, I think we've done pretty good. Look at this. We've done pretty good. 95% of people come to Christ through a thing called a relational circle that's already pre-existing in our lives. Isn't that interesting? At any one time, you and I have between 5 and 15 people that we're doing life with. Now, that might change. It might change, let's say, for instance, if you move area. Uh, it might change, for instance, for, for teenagers that, that leave a primary school and then go to a high school, that relational circle might change. Maybe your job might change. I used to work in the hospitality industry, okay, as a chef. And so if you came for dinner, guess what I was not doing? Eating dinner, because I was cooking for you. Guess what you were doing on a Saturday coming out for a meal? Guess what I was doing? I was in the kitchen cooking. So my days off were not a Saturday and a Sunday. My days off were on Monday and a Tuesday. Hospitality nights on the Gold Coast are now known as Tuesday nights. That's what we, we, there was a, but it didn't matter, even though I left school and my friends, I made a new relational circle. And you do that. You do that. Even in a Christian lifestyle, in your house and home, you make a circle. So at any one time, we have between five and 15 people that we're doing life together with. And out of that five to 15, there is at least one person in our circle of friends that we sort of rub shoulders with every day, whether they are unchurched or de-churched people. So maybe there's someone that do not know anything about Jesus or someone that did before but is now no longer following Jesus closely anymore. There's at least one. In our circle of friends that we are doing with, there's at least one that is pressing in or is in our circle or relationship circle that God has placed in there. I guarantee you've got one friend, like it doesn't matter, even if it's at work or whatever, it's that one that you tend to have lunch maybe more with. It's the one that you have conversations maybe more with. It's the one that goes further with, how are you doing? Yeah, good. Are you doing good? Yeah, I'm doing good too. Good, that's good. And then that's the, that's the combo. There's one that you do, oh, what did you get up to? Oh, did you know that? And someone that you may know of, someone that you may remember their birthday, someone that you may remember something that's going on in their life, or you've heard something go on, or something that you're doing deeper life with than maybe the rest of the five or the 15. It's called somebody who leans in on you. And in the Bible, this relational circle comes from a Greek word called oikos. Can you say that this morning? Oikos. Next slide, thank you, Sharon. Oikos is this Greek word which talks, first and foremost, it talks about an actual building a house. This, I'm in my house. But the deeper understanding of that comes from the word household. 
And in a Greek word, it's not like our Western word that we have today, where household is me and my kids and no more. I have my security cameras up. No one comes in on site. We don't open our doors. That's not the household we're talking about. In Greek idea, it was this like courtyard. It was this house and home that's always open that extended to your neighbor. It extended to your community or your block. Uh, We used to live in Ormo and we used to live on a circuit. And every year... Caitlin loved this. Every year, Boxing Day, we would close off two areas of the circuit and we would have people come around, we'd play cricket in the streets and from time to time some neighbours would come. And we would just close off the street. This was this relational thing that we're talking about. How many here live on a corner block or down the end of a street and there's like a block party or street party? Any street party? There's a couple, yeah. So it's not really that popular in our Western culture. But when something like this happens in like Greek culture or Jewish culture, the community is invited into that. This is how we get that, you know, it, it, takes, it takes like a community to raise up a child. And in years before, or in cultures before, this oikos understanding of household included much more than just your life you're living in. For instance, in some cultures, mum, grandma, and great-grandma all still live in the same house together. We, had, we, we bring them in. In the Italian family, it's, it's a family. And they just build on to a home. Because we're all a part and we take care of them and we honour that. And we look after our neighbour next door. We know what they're doing, you know. This is this oikos understanding. And Jewish culture is very much like that. Western culture is not. It appears 106 times in the scriptures where there's this reference towards something of like, you know, hey, we're closer together, we're coming in closer together, we understand one another, hey, I've got an uncle, hey, I've got a brother, hey, I've got this, we're together and we know what's going on. So let's go deeper and let's have a look at some other things when it talks to Oikos, thank you Sharon, and revisit this verse, John 1, 35 to 49. Now, This was Jesus' moment in choosing his disciples. And if we read through it again and apply this understanding of oikos to it, all of a sudden we see this web of people who knew one another. It's incredible, actually. So first of all, we have this part up the top up here. Oh, Andrew and John have disappeared, but they're supposed to be there. There's supposed to be two there in the middle. There you go, accidentally deleted. There They are, they've risen from the dead, okay? Um, there. So we have John the Baptist, and on the side of John the Baptist, supposed to be two more people, Andrew and John. So John the Baptist already had relationship. Now, John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. Mary and Martha, cousins. They're acquaintances. So John already knew Jesus. So that you can't. Just take off the fact that, that Jesus was, you know, all that, that he was. Understand when Jesus was young, he was a boy. Can you imagine these two playing together, mucking around together, playing with other kids together? You know, it was normal life. It's John, Jesus. Now, John had two disciples, Andrew and John. And Andrew and John followed Jesus. So through one relationship circle... By just a mere of Jesus' passing by and John saying who he was, this is who he is. See, here's the Christ. We point towards Jesus. Two were his disciples. Now, they happen to be, have a brother called Peter, Simon Peter. Now, you could, you could venture off because in other versions, there's also others that are a part, like James and John and so on, that are a part of the fishing tribe and Zebedee the dad. So the actual circle goes out further because they all became followers straight up. Zebedee even released his sons to go. Incredible, incredible story. All through relationship. And they sort of come into Christ. Now Philip on the other side over here, he came from the same town as these boys. 
So they would have known one another. They would have had an understanding. And same with Jesus. He knew of Philip and he went to Philip. But Philip had this mate called Nathaniel. Hey, Nathaniel, why don't you come? And in a moment of time, this oikos relationship, when it came to Christ, all of a sudden he had all these disciples that came to him, this coming in. It's amazing when you look at Jesus' life, who he had around him, and the influence that he already had because of relationship. How many barbecues do you think they did together? Yeah, Yeah. see what I mean? How many barbecues did they, this is what I mean, barbecue them to Jesus, you know? That's true. Let's have a look at a few more. Now, there's, there's a bunch in the Scripture. I'm just going to take these ones out. So here's the story in Luke chapter 8, which I will turn to. Luke chapter 8, it's great. And I'm just going to read the last part of it. Luke chapter 8 and verse 39. Now, this is the uh, demonic, demonic or demonic um, man who was gripped up. He was, he was living, they say, among the tombs, among the caves, you know, And Jesus came and he released him from the power of that. The demons fled into the pigs and they drowned. And then he was in his right mind. And he wanted to follow Jesus. He said, can I come and follow him? And look what Jesus said to him. He goes here. He says, return home, which is that oikos word, return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told told all over town. He told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. So Jesus sends him back to his circle of relationship that he had. Isn't that amazing? Here's Cornelius and his household in Acts chapter 10. The story of Cornelius is so deep. Peter is one day up on the top of the house and he's praying and, you know, God is dealing with him the things that he can eat and can't eat, the things he should do and shouldn't do, you know, and uh, God deals with him. And then right towards the end of this time that he has with the Lord, Jesus says to him, a guy's coming. He's going to pick you up and take you to Cornelius' house. I want you to go with him. It's okay. It's safe. <laughs> okay. And so Peter then wanders up the road. And he comes into contact in Cornelius' house. And Cornelius is a part of the Roman Empire, okay? And uh, he's, he's, he's over a region. And he's got maids, he's got servants, he's got slaves, he's got family, and they're all living in this one place. And let me just tell you right now, the Holy Spirit is moving in this place. They end up getting baptised and a whole range of things, okay? This whole household gets saved. And look what Cornelius says. Um, Verse 24, it says, The following day he arrived at Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and his close friends. So Cornelius was not afraid to bring people into his oikos and say, you need to come and experience Jesus. And they all end up, like I said, getting baptised in this place. Here's another one. Let's look at this. This is the jailer and his family in Acts chapter 16. Paul and Silas have been taken into prison. And they're in the jails. And, you know, an earthquake comes, whatever it is. But they're praising God. They're worshipping God. And the jailer experiences this. And everybody in his family gets saved. Again, this oikos, this is the jailer. And here we go in verse 31 to 33, it says this. The, uh, sorry, the jailer called for lights, rushed and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sir, what must we do to be saved? This is the jailer. And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. You and your household, your oikos. You and your household can be saved. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in the house. And that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. Oikos. 
What happens, you know, in just a moment of time, see, we get this mindset that we think that we need to leave where we are and go somewhere to share the gospel. But in fact, in a very area of influence, a circle, there are people that are there that God's already prepared. And the last one here is Zacchaeus, Luke chapter 19. We know the story of Zacchaeus. He was a small man. He was a tax collector. And he'd been doing some wrong. He'd been withholding money. But as you all know, tax collectors are not liked much. And Zacchaeus comes along because he wants to hear about Jesus and see Jesus. And he's too short. He can't see Jesus for the crowd. So he climbs up on a sycamore tree. I love that story. Just a little sidestep. I love that story. Can you imagine the day that the seed was put into the ground for that tree? Since Jesus creates all things. I wonder what heaven was saying when that seed went in the ground. Hey, Jesus, one day there'll be a young guy up there called Zacchaeus. We've just got to put this seed in the ground, you know, just to make sure this tree is right so that you can see him. Can you see that? Anyway, mindset. Coming back. Luke chapter 19, verse 9. And Zacchaeus, and, you know, Jesus, I must come to your household because I need to come and have lunch together. And in, in comes Jesus and all the disciples are there and the whole household is there. And I love this line. Jesus says to him, today salvation has come to this house. This house, this oikos, this place and this moment. Jesus comes and all of the household gets saved. So for just a moment, I want you to take a time to think about who is actually in your circle of influence already? Who is around you? What about that neighbour? You know, I have my neighbour and, um, and we're working on a relationship at the moment. The relationship at the moment is through cutting the grass. That's the relationship at the moment where a portion of his is connected to a portion of mine and I will whippersnip that and mow it one week and then the next week he will do that, you know? And, and back and forth and we talk from time to time and I'm starting a relationship with him through grass. That's, that's, that's what I'm doing because he is in my circle. He's my neighbour. I want to get to know him. I don't... I'm, I'm, I'm building up the courage on the other side because my portion is like a tenth of his size, okay? It's like massive. He's got a long piece at the front, you know? It's a bit of an extra. So I'm working up. I'm edging my way forward a little bit on that side just to give some appreciation, you know, to his side. But then eventually I'm going to start cutting that. And I'm just going to start that and have conversations. So we're going to talk. We've got to talk about the fence soon. We've got to repair, repair the fence. So, hey, building relationship and having relationship with him, you know, kind of stuff like that. That's one way. Other ways are, th- are people like at school that I work with and stuff. And then the circle is in that way. So who do you have in your circle? Who are those that are just there in your life? But who's that one or two that, are, that, that you really enjoy doing life together that, that's, that's pushing in, that's pressing in? that you could turn a normal conversation into a gospel conversation. Thank you, Sharon. Last slide. The early church understood that barriers to receiving the gospel came down and receptivity increased when the message came from known and trustworthy people. The church exploded through people who knew people. And when we sit in that place and we are trustworthy and we're honourable and we're consistent and we believe in God all the time, it paints a picture. It sets a pathway for people that we can have conversations with about that. Remember last week, it was like the the conversation I said, is could Jesus be the answer for this? You know, you're struggling with that. Could he be the one to help you in your life? As we engage in conversations with people that are in a a circle. See, there's a thing called the chicken line. We're going to talk about that one day. This chicken line, this like, man, I've got to step out and talk about Jesus. It's really hard. Who am I going to go to? You know, 
Who could I share the gospel with? Well, guess what? They're in our circle already. We just need to think about that a little bit more. You are most effective in reaching those for Jesus who are already within your relational circle. Remember, those that you reach for Jesus, guess what? They will know others that will. Those that you know about Jesus and are friends that you lead to Jesus, they will know others. They will automatically know others. They will know somebody saying, you know what, my friend needs to hear this. You know what, my wife needs to hear this. You know what, my kids need to hear this. Because once revelation comes into someone's life or the good of the, this of the gospel, there's just this urge, man, I've got to share this. And if you look at the early church, they had a love for one another. They gathered around and heard the apostles' teaching. But the third thing that they did is they had this fire to go out and share this good news. Because it was great and good, and then they just, they just went straight out into their circle of influence. And you look at all of them that came to Christ, they all virtually knew one another. And then one out of maybe 10 or 12 was somebody who was outside of that. And they would come in, and all of a sudden, a whole new reign of people would be brought to Christ. Oikos. Your relational circle, who's in that? Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you, Lord God, as we come before you, Father. Father, we sit in in a moment of just thinking about who is in our life and who you already placed in there. First of all, Father, I pray over all of us, even those ones listening online, Lord, for the courage to continue to walk towards people that don't know Jesus. The courage, Lord, to share our story. The courage to teach and to to bring people to an understanding that they're sons and daughters, that God wants them in his kingdom. Father, I pray you had your protection over each and every person. Over the ones, Lord God, that listen, over the ones that are, are believing. I thank you, Father God, for your protection as we press in. Lord, that you will open our hearts to see who is around us already. Lord, help us to believe within ourselves that we can do this because you anoint us and you are with us. Father, I thank you, Lord, that we make time for this. Make time for the importance of sharing the gospel. Father, I thank you, Lord, the value in that is so much more. Holy Spirit, reveal to us who is around us. Speak into our hearts about this, Lord. Father, we thank you for these things, Lord. While our heads are bowed, Father, we also also pray this morning and speak into those that don't know Jesus today. Those that are here that you do not know Jesus, those that listen online that you do not know Jesus. Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. The Father raised him from the dead and if you believe in that, you will be saved. We all fall short. We all do wrong. We all sin. And Jesus is the one who can save you from your sins. This morning, if you don't know Jesus, if you don't know who Jesus is and you want Jesus in your life, if there's anyone here in the house, would you just lift up your hand quickly so I can see that? I'd love to pray with you this morning to receive Jesus into your heart. If there's anybody online that you do not know who Jesus is, Please let us know. Let's let's pray this this morning. Father God, I come to you today through the mighty name of Jesus. And I say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I acknowledge you are the Son of God. I acknowledge that you died on the cross. I acknowledge that the Father rose him from the dead. And today, if I believe in that, you will take away my sin 
I'll be born again and saved. Lord, be Lord over my life. Come into my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, 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 amen. Thank you, guys. Really, really stoked how everyone has been very receptive about the teaching and, and people are thinking about things. Some people are talking about it already. Some people are praying into this place. Some people have already had one-on-one encounters with people about this. I just want to encourage you with that, that if the, the moment we just keep doing this, sharing the love, you watch, people will come to Christ. Jesus is, you know, the Holy Spirit's doing something at the moment. He's opening up people's hearts, you know, and I just want you to be ready and prepared for those kind of things because you never know in your circle who needs Jesus. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Honey, why don't you come and finish off? Sunday, Palm Sunday today, where we know Jesus rode into town on a donkey and they were praising him as king, as Lord, and throwing palm leaves down and things like that, weren't they? But we also know over the course of this week, we remember that they quickly turned and uh, crucified him. And we celebrate next weekend. Yes, we celebrate the crucifixion because he died for the punishment of our sins. He paid the price. He is our substitute. He made the transaction on our behalf. So we are forgiven, but we even more so celebrate his resurrection on Easter Sunday. So next Sunday, we will be having an Easter service here. We're having a Passover feast. So we're going to have Um, an item of worship. We're going to have a meal together. That's why we're calling it a Passover feast. We're not going to have just unleavened bread and olives and things like they would have had back then, but we're just going to do something a little bit different for the service as we remember Resurrection Sunday and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior and how in Him rising, He made a path for us back to the Father It's all because of him. And he is, the Father has raised us up in Christ. When we make him Lord of our lives, we are raised up out of our sin and the shame and guilt and punishment, all those things we're going to celebrate next weekend. So we invite you to come along 9.30 next Sunday for our Passover feast. We're going to worship together. We're going to eat together. We're going to have communion together. Aren't we, Eviana? You're excited. I know. Uh, So please bring along a plate of food to share. We're going to have brunch. Try not to bring crumbly biscuits and cakes that the kids are going to spread across the floor for me. And it takes me three hours to vacuum. But bring something along to share that is brunch because we're going to be community together and we're going to be sitting around the table together remembering who Christ is and what he has done. This is the biggest day for the Christian church. I'm going to say to you, I mean, the world and what we do at Christmas, we make Christmas much, uh, such a big thing, a presence and family time and all this, but as the body of Christ, Easter is the best day ever to come together and worship our Lord and Savior, amen? So try and join us. There'll be a bunch of things. I think we'll have an egg and spoon race for the kids as well. We're not going to do an Easter egg hunt, I don't think, because we just want to keep it about Christ and the meal around the table, remembering the Passover. And we'll talk about that a bit more next week. So that's next Sunday. As well, stay connected so we can keep you up to date with these things. You can scan the QR codes that are around the building. Just pop your details in there. And all we do with that is send you information when we have these special things on and encourage you. All righty. We as well do have tithes and offerings. So if you would like to give, the biggest thing about tithes and offerings is our heart attitude. I was just talking about what we're going to be celebrating more so next week. We celebrate every day what Christ has done for us. But one area that we don't always like to surrender is our finances. So if you do have a revelation of that and you would like to bring your tithes and offerings, the details are on the screen or there's an FPOS machine up the back there. But my encouragement to you is your heart posture toward God 
And that's the reason we give finances, apart from to help people in and through the body of Christ, it's to surrender that financial area to God as well, because we want him to be Lord of every area of our lives. All righty, let's stand. The kids have been so great in there. It's a bit difficult for them being out of our normal Centro Kids routine. So guys, you've been amazing in there, and thank you, Miss Tash, for what you're doing. They're actually working on a fruit of the spirit tree. Uh, They've been learning about the fruit of the spirit and how we each have a secret garden in our hearts. When we make Jesus Lord of our lives and we surrender to the Lord, the Holy Spirit grows his fruit in our hearts and in our secret garden. And those fruit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And that's what the kids have been learning about. Not, not just rules and regulations, but about having a relationship with their Father God so that he can grow his beautiful fruit in them and shine out to other people so they can, too can know God. How awesome is that, that our kids get to learn all that great stuff at such a young age? All righty, let's pray this morning before we chat and go our way. Lord, We declare again that you are Christ, our Lord and Savior. We celebrate you today as as the people did earlier, even in the Old Testament, that they celebrated you coming in. But Lord, you had a purpose. You were about the Father's will to give of yourself in our substitute, as our substitute, a transaction, the wages for our sin. And we're so grateful for that. And we celebrate you today. And Lord, as we go out these doors today, I pray that you remind us of the message that was preached. You remind us of your word. You lead us by your Holy Spirit so that we can take you to the people around us. Lord, that the people will only be able to explain our life in terms of you because we do not have the capacity to be successful on our own. We need you, Lord. We want you to shine to the world around us. So I pray that you would be our provision this week. Lord, you would be our protection And you will be our direction, Lord. Give us the courage to do what you lead us to do this week. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. God bless you. Why don't you stay and have a chat with someone? And we'll see you all through the week.